each one of us, um, there are things that Jesus is working on in us to make us more like himself. The goal of discipleship is that after walking with your rabbi, you'll become just like your rabbi. You'll become just like Jesus. And so I've been on a journey with Jesus, and um, it's a long way from over. (laughs) And he started some new things on the walk for me this year, and I want to share them with you today. Um, Some of this stuff is going to be a little bit vulnerable for me, um, but I, I really feel compelled to share it this morning. And, um, and some of it may feel a little bit like a slap in the face, but it's going to be good and encouraging at the end, okay? So hang on. I, and I, I think it's going to bring some breakthroughs that some of you have been wanting but not knowing how to get to. Um, and, and that's how, how my, my story, uh, or this part of my journey has, has started. Um, every January, our church sets aside um, a certain amount of time to pray and fast and seek God. We want to give the first portion of our year to God, dedicate it to Him, so the rest will be blessed, right? And so we spend time just asking God, what do you want out of our year? What do you want out of our days? Because that's the only thing that's really worthwhile. And um, so it, back in December, I started asking God, kind of advanced, knowing our, our church time of seeking God was coming up. I started asking God, what, what do you want me to focus on? And immediately I got the word discipline. And God said, this year is about discipline for me. And, um, and when he said that, I immediately knew uh, that there were areas of my life that did not have enough discipline. <laughs> But I also knew that God wasn't just putting his finger on one thing. He was saying, I want you to be a disciplined person. Like, I want discipline to be part of who you are. Um, I want discipline in everything. And so the, the journey started with that. I didn't know what it was going to look like. Um, but one of the thoughts that came to me initially was, um, if there's anything that characterizes a disciple is discipline. I'm not going to be a great disciple without discipline. Who wants to be a great disciple? We want to be like Jesus, so we need discipline. And I started to realize that discipline is a matter of character. And character makes up who you are. You know, if, if, you, if you possess the character trait of wisdom, you are wise. If you possess the character trait of discipline, you become a disciple. And uh, anyway, so on this journey, I started, I started just pondering, okay, God, what, what is discipline supposed to look like for me? And for me, the biggest one is I'm a chunky disciple. <laughs> and, uh, and my health has taken a back seat to other concerns in my life, and I consider myself to be a fairly spiritually disciplined person, but not with my body. And, and God started talking to me, and I knew this was the first thing he wanted to talk to me about, and I didn't want to talk to him about that because, you know, that's not very spiritual. Um, you know, like, we're going to go into the week of prayer and fasting, and we're going to talk about kingdom things, and God was talking to me about my body. And, and you know, I am... My body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. And he, and he started talking to me about discipline with my body, discipline with my health, discipline with my weight, discipline with my fitness. And I wasn't super thrilled to hear that, but I knew it's God's agenda, so I better just say yes now. <laughs> um, and I was talking to Unisha about that, and, and I just started telling her some of my honest reasons why I feel like I can't relate to people who are in shape, people who are not overweight, for example, people who are in the gym getting buff and all those things. And, and the, the biggest thing was I disagreed with their motivation. You know, um, I go to the gym and I see people that are um, building muscle, losing weight, and it's all for vanity. You know, or it's they're trying to impress someone or they want to hook up with someone 
or they, they want to never lose a fight or, you know, all these reasons. And I was just feeling like, I don't, I don't share any of those motivations. In fact, that some of them I think are ungodly and wrong. And, and as I was telling Unisha about this, God spoke to me and he said, John, what did David's mighty men look like? And so I started thinking, and, and some images just flashed through my head from, from reading the word about these guys that, you know, you have one guy who single-handedly stands in a field and defeats hundreds of his enemies. And then there's the guy who climbs into a pit on a snowy day and kills a lion with his bare hands. <laughs> and as I'm seeing these, these images, I'm thinking, those guys were... They were strong. <laughs> they, and, and I was seeing in the image of my head, and they looked like it. And, and, and God just spoke to me. He said, John, discipline looks like something. And he said, I want you to look like discipline, even with your body, that your body would look like discipline. And something shifted inside of me where I realized, okay, there's something that glorifies God when I'm disciplined, even with my body. And, and so I was like, okay, God, I don't know where to go with this, but yes, <laughs> I want to look like discipline. I want to look like what discipline looks like. And the next day I'm on YouTube and I come across a video. I don't know how I came across it. Um, I like to watch hunting videos. And this one pops up and it's, uh, it's about an event called Train to Hunt. And uh, basically, it's like an, an athletic competition that tries to get hunters to get in shape um, early in the year so that they can go conquer the mountains later in the year when it's actually hunting season. And the video was made by this lady who blew out her knee in a snowmobile accident. And she's competing in this event with a brace on and, and doing stuff that was like, I can never do that. <laughs> no way could I do that. And, and she opened the video with this quote. She said, the difference between where you are and where you want to be is simply what you're willing to do. And I realized that there's a lot of things that I say I want. There are a lot of goals that I have, vision I have for my life, but I'm not willing to do anything about it. I don't have the character trait of discipline to get me from here to there. And so something shifted in me again watching that video. And so I thought, well, that looks like, you know, there are people who are doing that event. Maybe, maybe that is something I can relate to. I'm going to try it. So I researched the, the event and the organization. And, um, and I found out that you can get a personal trainer to help you with uh, getting ready for the event because it's grueling, the things that you go through. It's kind of, if, if any of you are familiar with Spartan Race, it's like Spartan Race plus archery to get you ready for archery hunting. And uh, so I started looking into the trainers and, and all the stuff, and I, and I tried messaging them. Nobody answered. Tried messaging again. Nobody answered. Started trying to contact the personal trainers on Facebook, you know, stalk them, <laughs> find their contact info. Nobody's answering. I finally got an answer back a couple of weeks later from one of the trainers, uh, they contacted me back and, and started talking, and, and I talked to Unisha about it. and was like, yes, this is, this is what God wants me to do. Discipline looks like something. And so I just decided to, to bite the bullet, go for it. And after I made the commitment that I was going to do it, the trainer just decided to give me a one-third discount on the price. So expenses decrease, right? <laughs> that came after I decided to obey and do it. And, uh, and I knew that this wasn't just going to be like, yay, train for hunting, but this was something Jesus was leading me into to get my temple looking like discipline. So I started into that and, and just felt God's blessing was all around me. And everywhere I was turning, um, people were talking about discipline. Um, I couldn't get away from the word discipline. And I knew that God was, was leading me on, on that, that path. So I started doing my training 11 weeks ago. Yay! Um, and I never thought in my life I'd do 11 weeks of training. Um, but at the same time, uh, I started reading the book of Proverbs. And in Proverbs, 
chapter 10, verse 17, it says this. It says, whoever heeds discipline shows the way to life, but whoever ignores correction leads others astray. And, and I knew that God was speaking to me about the reason he wanted me to be disciplined is not just because of me, but because people know me. People know you. And the level of discipline in your life directly correlates to the amount of life they experience and the amount of death you experience. <laughs> Whoever heeds discipline shows the way to life. And I knew God was saying that as a leader, my example with my body was not leading people towards life or truth. Um, and at the same time, that if I ignored this, I would be leading other people astray. And so it was just encouragement again to, to jump back in. Um, and then the first week of training, the trainer assigned me a book to read. I'm like, what? I thought we were going to be exercising. <laughs> read a book. It's called Chop Wood, Carry Water. And I had never heard of it. It was a lot of money for a little book. <laughs> I start the book, and I, it was like, I'm set up. It was such a setup. It's, a, it's, a, it's all about discipline, and it's a, it's a narrative about a young man named John <laughs> who wants to be an archer <laughs> and who goes to study archery in Japan. And immediately I was just like, oh my gosh, this is setting me up because the, I love missions. I love all that stuff. My first mission trip was to Japan. Uh, we, we had a Japanese um, kid who lived with us uh, for a while when, when I was a boy. And so Japan is like huge on my heart. And so I just, it was like this whole thing is like straight at me. God's got me cornered. And so all of it was coming together. Discipline, discipline, discipline. And, and as I started going through the book of Proverbs, let me tell you something about Proverbs. Up until now, I have not liked the book of Proverbs. Just being honest, I believe the book of Proverbs is from God, but I have not liked it. And the reason is that Proverbs is not one of those books that you draw a lot of theology out of, where you can like think about it, you know, press in deeper. It's like it tells you what to do, and if you're not doing it, you're stupid. <laughs> That's actually what it says. That's what the book of Proverbs says. And it's, and it's like, here's how to be wise, so do it. Here's how to be a fool. And if you do that, you're stupid. And, and I didn't like it. I couldn't just ponder it and believe it. It made me feel responsible. So it's like, you know, you just kind of like, let's go on to Thessalonians or you know, something that I can think about, you know, something in the faith nebulous, out there realm, um, the supernatural. There's not much supernatural stuff in Proverbs. And I like supernatural stuff because my natural doesn't have to do much. God does it, right? Um, Proverbs doesn't make room for laziness, which I value very deeply. <laughs> My mom used to warn me about procrastinating, and I would be like, but mom, see, that's the difference between you and me. I'm procrastination, and you're anti-crastination. <laughs> and we would laugh and laugh. <laughs> yeah, she's probably praying, but I'll tell you what happened. It turned into a diversion for me to not feel the pain of the truth of it. And so I, I learned to procrastinate very well and come up with all sorts of excuses of why I wasn't doing anything. Um, and I've got a witty, fast-thinking side of me that was able to just like throw out an answer to divert responsibility at any time. And uh, it was in my best interest to do so. <laughs> and, and what I've realized this year, going through Proverbs, is how high of a cost I have paid and I'm still paying because of some of those decisions of really being stupid. Proverbs 12.1 says, Whoever loves discipline loves knowledge, but he who hates correction is stupid. That's what it says. 
And I realize that I don't love discipline. I avoid discipline. And there's a correlation between discipline and how correctable you are. If you're not willing to be corrected, then you're not going to be disciplined. Um, I have some great notes here I'm going to read to you because I said it better there. You cannot be a disciple if you're not disciplined. And you cannot be disciplined if you cannot be corrected. If you can accept correction, then you can be disciplined. And if you can be disciplined, then you can be a disciple. So this morning, I just want to tell you some of the lessons I'm learning so far. I'm obviously a long way from my goal, but I've learned a lot in this process. And God has been, because it hasn't just been a New Year's resolution for me. It's been something that God brought to my attention. I'm obeying it. And now there's grace and power on me to do it. Um, I even had some random person that I, I met um, in uh, another state that I only met them once. And they wrote to me and they said, I just felt like I was supposed to send this prophetic word to you from Patricia King. And the word from Patricia King was all about how God was going to put grace on discipline for physical health. And it brought up how Proverbs talks about guard your heart above all else, for out of it flow the issues of life. I've always made that spiritual, you know, like guard your heart, you know, don't don't let your emotions get, you know, or whatever. What about the one beating in your chest? Guard your actual physical heart, because really life depends on that. Issues flow out of that. And, and God has a grace on that. So that was encouraging also. Um, and here's another thing I noticed. I went to, I, I don't want to point anybody out by saying this, so I'll be, I'm going to try to be vague. I went to a conference a while back after God started me on this journey. And in the airports, you know, you're around thousands of people. And I go from the airports to, straight to the conference, and there's, there's probably about a thousand people at the conference, and what hit me really hard when I walked in the door is how many fat people there were. Because I had been surrounded by crowds the entire time while I was in the airports, but the percentage of overweight people in this Christian group was the majority in the room, and especially the leaders that were there. And, and I'm not pointing a finger because that was me included. <laughs> but I realize we're a big group of undisciplined people. And, and, and it's showing to the world. Um, and I was going somewhere with this. Maybe I need to stop so I'm being nice. <laughs> but I, I, I realized that it's, it's an outward display of my level of character and our level of character. And the percentage was higher with us. I know where I was going. And, and we happened to be at a supernatural conference, one of those, prophetic, supernatural, all the crazies like our church type of conference. And, and I realized we're just so in the clouds that we dismiss the importance of the temple that we have here. And, and really, it's great to be connected to heavenly things, but as believers, we're not supposed to be happy with heaven being there and us going up there. We're supposed to bring heaven on earth. And that's going to happen through the temple of the Holy Spirit, which is, in part, our physical bodies. So that was just part of my experience. That also was kind of a shock to my system, realizing like, wow, this is us. <laughs> And I started realizing that our, our culture as revival churches is anti-discipline. And, and part of that is that, you know, we live in America for one, and America is all about instant gratification right now. We were founded with a belief that the pursuit of happiness is a right given to us by God. That may be true, but at this point in our nation's history, that has become the supreme pursuit above all else, the pursuit of happiness. 
and technology and, and advancements in society have given us the ability to have happiness now without any process, without any work. And, uh, and process is always about work and waiting, and we just don't do that anymore. It's about gaining pleasure right now. And then compound that in our kind of church where we believe in the kingdom of God now, miracles now, at the same time, we're breeding this instant heaven stuff too. Like no process. I just get heaven now without work, without waiting. And, and I, love, I love our kind of church. I love our circle that we flow in. But there's a weakness for us, and it's in the area of discipline. And one of the things that, that I've been seeing is that there are, there are believers in other Christian groups that have, they've walked with God for years, 40, 50 years, they've never seen a miracle. And their faith in God and their commitment to Him is absolutely unwavering. And then in our circles, we have uh, young people, my generation and younger, that have grown up knowing nothing but miracles, and we can't stay on track with God. We're all over the place. I, I know young people that have seen thousands of miracles and are not walking with Jesus, maybe because he didn't answer one. And the discipline level is a huge part of the difference because in the other circles, all they've known is discipline to make yourself strong. They've practiced something called spiritual disciplines, which I, I wish I could talk about today, but I don't have time. There's a thing called spiritual disciplines. Part of that's reading the word, meditating on the word, memorizing the word, prayer, fasting. They've got that stuff down, whether they feel like it or not, whether there's a miracle or not. And they've built strength in themselves that a lot of us on our side haven't built because everything's been instant. And the moment we don't have a miracle, we're floppy as a fish in terms of being able to stand for Jesus. You know, the, the parable that Jesus talked about, the wise man and the foolish man. Um, one built his house on the rock. The other built his house on the stand. It says when the, the sand, not the stand. <laughs> it says when the storms came and the winds blew, one house fell flat and the other one stood firm. And the difference is the rock that one man built his house on. And a lot of people have substituted, just because we actually don't even know the Bible well enough to know that one story, we've substituted other things for what that rock is. We're like, the rock is Jesus. No, it's not. Jesus is not the rock that that house was built on that Jesus was talking about. He said, if you hear my words and obey them, you've built your house on the rock. You can't know the words of Jesus unless you've read them. And you can't build yourself on them unless you know his words well enough to keep them and make them permanent in your life. So that's the discipline difference between some of these different Christian groups is that the ones who haven't seen miracles, they've just been building their house on a really good rock for a long time. And when they experience the supernatural, oh my gosh, <laughs> they're spiritual champions and giants. But at the same time, our group doesn't know the word. And, and we're just like the love of God and the whatever. <laughs> And we don't have a foundation. We've got the house on top, but we don't have what's underneath. And so discipline really matters. So I'm talking this morning a lot about my, my part of the journey, which has been my physical body. But these principles apply to the character of discipline that we need in our whole life. Um, Proverbs 13, 18. It says, he who ignores discipline comes to poverty and shame, but whoever heeds correction is honored. Proverbs 13, 24, he says, He who spares the rod hates his son, but he who loves him is careful to discipline him. Discipline is crucial for life. In the beginning of Proverbs, it has this description that 
is the, is the opposite. It's the one you don't want to hear about your own life. It says, at the end of your life, you will groan when your flesh and body are spent. You will say, how I hated discipline. How my heart spurned correction. I would not obey my teachers or turn my ear to my instructors. And I was soon in serious trouble in the assembly of God's people. Here's what's crazy about this. This is talking about someone who believes in God. One of God's people who ends their life that way. That at the end, you're like, it's all regret. You know, one of the most popular sayings right now is no regrets. And it's usually not true. It's usually, I don't want to think about that right now, but I'm going to have major regrets. At the end of your life, you'll groan when your flesh and body are spent. You will say, how I hated discipline. And in the end it says, and I was soon in serious trouble in the assembly of God's people. So you can be a believer sitting in these seats today and not have the same outcome as the person next to you. And it has to do with whether you love discipline and you take correction, you have teachers, you have instructors. Isn't it nice to know that you can be a Christian and God has a wonderful plan for your life and it still comes out as a total wreck? <laughs> it's all about loving discipline. Proverbs 15:32 says, "Those who disregard discipline despise themselves, but the one who heeds correction gains uh, gains understanding." Do you despise yourself this morning? <laughs> I hope not. Proverbs 19, 18, discipline your children, for in that there is hope. Do not be a willing party to their death. You see where that, that's going? It's like discipline is so important that if you don't teach it to your kids, they will die. And you're going to be the reason for it. A willing party, it means, yeah, I was willing for this to happen. And then Proverbs, uh, Hebrews 12, 10 through 11, uh, talks about fathers, and it says, They disciplined us for a little while as they thought best, but God disciplines us for our good, in order that we may share in His holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. And I can testify to that. <laughs> Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. So God as our Father is very interested in training us in the character of discipline so that we can have a harvest. And a harvest, essentially, that's, a, that's kind of a Bible word. It's an agricultural word that we don't relate to so much anymore. But it means that when you try something, you get the results that you intended. If you, if you are a farmer and you go and plant a bunch of seeds and you work and work and work and nothing grows, or you have fruit trees and there's no fruit, it's over, right? It was a waste. Having a harvest means that what you intended to receive when you set out, that you receive. And discipline is a key part of that. So in, in this uh, book that I was assigned to read, Chop Wood, Carry Water, the, off, the author said, uncomfortable isn't a choice, but where you experience it is. And so we have this opportunity in our lives, by the grace of God, to enter into discipline now, or we can get it later. <laughs> They're both uncomfortable. One is far more uncomfortable. And the author continued and said, under pressure, you don't rise to the occasion. You sink to the level of your training. It's so true. Under pressure, you don't rise to the occasion. We all want to think like if stuff goes bad, if the world goes haywire, I'm going to rise up in faith. I'm going to be, I'm going to be ready for anything. I've got God. But the reality is, we don't do that. We sink to the level of our training. And that's what I was talking about, the different church groups, the groups that haven't seen miracles but have built their lives on the Word. They can get slammed with storms. 
and everybody will, but they can get slammed with storms and they're unshaken by it because the level of their training lifted them up. They built their house high on a rock, as Psalm 27 says. And the others, even though they've had the miracles, they sink to the level of their training. They don't have anything. And, and that, that happens with, with every area of life. And I think with David and Susan's story, part, part of what I also see that happen was they could have walked out of those vehicles and cursed God. It's like, oh my gosh, I can't believe this happened. You know, all this stuff. But I think that, that they evidenced what they have trained for for so long. They've trained in peace, in the peace of God. They've trained in the confidence. I know for years David has pressed in to Psalm 91. And knowing that God is with him in the middle of chaos, he's trained for that again and again and again, so that he's even able, while the car is flipping, to have thoughts <laughs> about how things are going and to recognize God's hand. And, uh, and so you see a different example than for some other people. And I think even that released the angelic with them. So leave that thought with you. Got to keep moving. The author also, also said this, and, and it was one of the most impacting things to me. He said, you can't cheat the person in the mirror. Discipline is about who you are. You can fool a lot of other people for a certain amount of time, but you can't cheat the person in the mirror. Deep down, you know whether you have cut corners and cheated, and subconsciously, that is incredibly difficult to overcome. And so... We have to get discipline in our lives, and we have to do it. You know, how many of you know we should be ready in season and out of season? That's our goal, right? I want to be ready to be a Jesus person. I want to be ready for anything the enemy throws at me in season and out of season. If you want that, you have to train in season and out of season. You have to learn discipline in season and out of season. You've got to do it when you don't feel like it. Um, the, the trainer I'm working with, you know, like started in January is like, you're going to hike every week. Like, are you nuts? I live in Montana. <laughs> like, how am I supposed to do that? First hike, ice storm, <laughs> you know, but that prepares you so that later, if you're actually hunting in an ice storm and you're going to sink to the level of your training, I've done this. I'm ready for it. I know what to do and I won't give up at that point. And it's the same with anything that you think you want to win at later. You've got to train for it, be disciplined in that, and receive discipline from God in that. So here's one of the biggest lessons that I've learned along the way, and I've already kind of mentioned it, but that's I've learned that excuses are the enemy of discipline. And if discipline is part of our character and who we are, excuses are our enemy. They are against us. I think this was a God thought. <laughs> As I was just thinking about excuses through this whole process, I had this thought come to my mind that excuses are my lack of character coming out of my mouth out loud in front of everybody. And excuses reinforce strongholds in my life, making it harder to be free every time I repeat them. When I make excuses, I'm denying the very spirit of God that lives inside of me. I'm declaring my unbelief in the words of God that I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength, that I am more than a conqueror through Christ Jesus. When I make an excuse, I'm saying, I don't believe that. I have reasons why that's not true. And unbelief, we know from the word, unbelief is straight up sin. And excuses often are an expression that I'm in sin and I'm okay to stay that way. And sin is falling short of the glory of God. So every time I'm making excuses, I'm like, I'm okay to not live in glory. 
I'm okay to not have the fullness of glory. And I don't think Jesus is okay with that. We talked about that last week. Jesus is worthy of more glory from me. And when I make excuses, I'm moving in the opposite direction of glorifying Jesus. It takes faith to please God. It takes faith to be saved. It takes faith to be a disciple. It takes faith to not make excuses. You say, okay, I do believe that I can do all things through Christ, that I am more than a conqueror. You ever thought about that verse? It doesn't mean that you're a conqueror. It means you are more than a conqueror, like you conquered and then some. What's the and then some part? It's like the enemy attacked you and you won, and then you went and stole all of his stuff. <laughs> you know? More than a conqueror through Christ Jesus. Excuses are the enemy of all of that. I did a little uh, game with our youth group and our young adults group where I had them write down things that they want to do and reasons why they haven't. And they wrote them down on separate pieces of paper. What I want to do, but... And then I mixed them all up. So the things that they wanted to do and the reasons why they haven't done it are all jumbled and in the wrong order. And it, some of them came out pretty hysterical. Um, I tried to replicate that list as good as I could today. And I just want to read some of them to you. I want to get a boyfriend. But the cost of weddings these days is ridiculous. <laughs> I want to lose weight. But my kids keep leaving their dirty socks laying on the floor. I want to stop eating out, but I'm terrible at talking to boys. I try to keep secrets, but I'm out of shape. I try not to drink, but I am addicted to chocolate. I wish I could do pull-ups, but I live right next to Taco Bell and can smell it every time I go outside. I wish that I could get married, but I just need that break every two hours. I want to propose, but I just don't understand biology. <laughs> I, try to remember I try to remember people's names, but I can't afford it. <laughs> I try to be patient, but a girl needs her coffee, you know? <laughs> no, not you. <laughs> I want to get a boyfriend, but you kind of need an airplane for that. <laughs> I want to get engaged, but it's just like their face is stuck in my head and all I can think of is Bob. <laughs> I try to have good grades, but I'm gluten free right now. I want to be confident, but I'm afraid my girlfriend will say no. I wish I could do pull ups, but my alarm clock doesn't work. I wish that I could get married, but sometimes I can't stop laughing. I want to propose, but I'm terrible at swimming and I think I might drown. I try to remember people's names, but it's kind of hard when your neighbor is blasting Norwegian death metal all night long. I want to be a pilot, but my fishing buddy always brings a beer. I try to be patient. Oh, I already did this one. I want to eat healthier, but my alarm clock doesn't work. I want to own more land, but I'm addicted to chocolate. I want to get to church on time, but I'm lactose intolerant. <laughs> okay, so you can obviously see that those got mixed, and they sound ridiculous when they're mixed. When they're, sep when they're separated, they don't make sense. Like, it makes sense to say, I want to be a pilot, but you need a plane for that. It doesn't make sense to say, I want a boyfriend, but you need a plane for that. That's ridiculous. Like, no, you don't. What kind of excuse is that? And the reality is, every time we make an excuse, especially to God, it sounds just like that in his ears. Because he said, you can do all things. You have everything you need for life and godliness in Christ Jesus. You know, from the heavenly realms, you've been blessed with every spiritual blessing. God is for you. He's never going to leave you. Excuses are bad, aren't they? 
So with the time we have left, I just want to give you some tips I have learned to becoming disciplines. Um, choose one thing to be disciplined in and do it for the glory of God. You hear something like this, you just be like, oh my gosh, I'm not disciplined at anything. <laughs> But choose one thing to be disciplined in and do it for the glory of God. You don't have to tackle everything else at once because the, the character you develop in becoming disciplined in one thing is what God can use in you to be disciplined in everything else. You've learned those lessons. You've become disciplined. You have the tools to become disciplined in every other part of your life. And it really starts a chain reaction without you even realizing it where things just start falling in line. One of the things that's happened for me working with the trainer is that exercise is part of my life, six days a week for at least two hours. And suddenly things have shifted with my eating. Um, I don't miss garbage food because I'm just ready to inhale any healthy food that's in front of me. <laughs> I'm so hungry. <laughs> but the chain reaction has gone all the way to, I read my Bible more and more consistently, my prayer time is better, my time with my wife and my kids is better. Those are all areas that I want to be more disciplined in. And starting with discipline in one has led to discipline in all the others because my character is changing. Who I am is changing. Does that make sense? And so even though I used to think I was a pretty spiritually disciplined person, comparatively, in my prideful thinking, what I realized is that my real character was expressed in my body. And when I started upping my discipline with my body, it fed back into my spiritual life to increase discipline there. And the, and the results are awesome. And I started realizing some areas where I really didn't have spiritual discipline. It was just not costly for me at the time. So it was easy. Um, set a definable, clear goal for yourself. You should be able to say it in one sentence. Getting in shape, losing weight, being in the word more are bad examples. They're, they're good, but they're nebulous. Instead, change it to, I want to be able to climb big mountain. Instead of, I want to get in shape. Make it clear. What do you want to be able to do? I want to lose 20 pounds. I want to read my Bible for 20 minutes every day. Make it something that's clear and measurable that you know if you did it or not. And then set a date you will accomplish your goal by. One of the things that has pushed me immensely is knowing that there is a, there's an athletic competition coming up where people are going to do things that I cannot do right now. <laughs> and the date is drawing near quickly. I've got to just go, 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 go. And it's kept me pushing myself at a rate I wouldn't have otherwise. Because just as long as I get there someday, you know, that'll be good. But it's like we, we, we've tried to teach this to our boys, especially. Obedience isn't obedience if you wait to do it, if you delay Obedience is obedience when you do it now, because God asks you now. And so setting a date for yourself on discipline issues is saying, yeah, God, I'm going to do something about this now. I've got a, a date of completion that you can check back with me that I did what you said. That's a good thing, right? Puts things into perspective. And make a schedule for each day. When are you going to do what you said you'd do? One of the first things I did with Unisha is we, we just looked at a calendar, uh, Google Calendar, where we can look at the hourly view of each day. And I just blocked out, this is when these things will happen that I say are priorities in my life. This is when I'll exercise. This is when I'll sleep and how long I'll sleep. This is when I'm going to go to work. This is when I'm going to meet these people. You know, all those things are, are laid out. And because I shared that with Unisha, and I've shared that with other people, they know what's going on. They help me do that. To keep going. Refuse to make excuses. Instead of talking about why you can't do something, find one thing that you can do. 
my trainer calls these modifications. So my second week into training, I injured my knee. Up until this point in my life, that would be me saying, I guess God doesn't want me to, <laughs> you know, just rest, soaking, you know, <laughs> all those things. But instead, because I know that God is calling me to discipline and I'm working with the trainer, we found something else for me to do. We found a way for me to do cardio with my arms. And I'm getting way more of a workout than I've ever gotten in my life doing cardio <laughs> with my arms. I found something that I can do instead of saying I can't work out because I have one problem. There's a lot of things I still can do. And so instead of finding an excuse, find an answer. Just don't give an excuse. If you hear yourself say, I can't do it because, or I can't, I want to do it, but you need to start over and go back to what you can do. And because I found a modification, didn't make excuses, I'm starting week 11. Yes. Um, and be prepared to ignore the naysayers. I was kind of surprised. Um, I've been posting, I started posting um, stuff about my, my health journey on social media, partially because I just wanted to hold myself accountable, knowing everybody knows what I said I'd do. And the majority of the comments I've gotten have been negative, of people picking at what I'm doing and just spewing stuff. And what I found out is that um, when you pursue godly character and you start changing, everybody else around you suddenly is exposed if they have the same issue and, or if they have a similar issue or God's been talking to them about changing. And the only way that they can not change with you is to find what's wrong with what you're doing. And so people do that. They, they'll try to discredit you or they'll try to say why you have some special ability that they don't. And um, you just have to be ready to block those things out and keep moving ahead. Because um, even though the majority of those have been negative, I also have had a few people who have, who have come to me and said, you know what, I've been watching you and I'm in. And they're making huge life changes to, to also um, become disciplined, especially with their bodies, which is cool. Uh, I recommend finding a hero and studying them, somebody who's doing what you want to do. And just learn about that. It keeps you excited about where you could be. Be accountable. You need someone who will hold you accountable. Um, having a trainer has been, it's, it's made all the difference for me. I've had a gym membership since, since I was 17 years old. <laughs> look where it got me, you know, <laughs> like, yay, that's exciting. Um, and I've been, I've been, I've had a membership at like six different gyms in this valley. It wasn't the gym's fault, right? But I just have a membership and it's just me without accountability. I just go and I feel like it. And when I go, I do what I feel like and I don't do what I don't feel like and wander around and all those things. Uh, but having a trainer means I've got to an answer for what I did this week. Did I do it? And the trainer is making me do things that I would not have dared do before. And also helping me avoid some stupid things I might have done on my own. Um, yeah, so find someone you can be accountable to. I recommend someone that scares you a little bit. Someone that you respect who has already done it. So that... You can't make excuses rather than someone else who is in the same boat as you. And they're like, well, it's OK. I didn't exercise either. <laughs> that type of deal. Or I, I didn't read my Bible this week either. I also don't recommend your spouse just because you don't need any extra attention. <laughs> you need your spouse to be your encourager, which Misha has been awesome for me. So um, be consistent. That book that I've been reading says, if you want to become great, you must consistently be willing to do what others will not. And if you choose to do what others won't, eventually you will be able to do what others can't. 
Be consistent. Galatians 6, 7 says, Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. If you keep sowing and sowing and sowing and sowing consistently, you will have a consistent large harvest. If you're not consistent, you will get inconsistent results. And then realize that your smallest decisions matter. The difference between wildly successful people and people who are not is often just inches. Just inches. When you add up inches, you can cover any distance in the universe. And in, in archery, just one inch change in your, in your position of your hands or your feet can make you hit the bullseye or can make it completely sail over the top of the target. Just one inch can change all of that. And the, so it's those small dec- decisions that matter. It's not the biggest things. It's usually the things that most other people think are too small to matter. And at the same time, those small decisions count for bad stuff too. You know, like how many of us know that if you eat junk, eventually it'll kill you? You know? Yet, our nation is like, have at it. It's all we have is junk food. All we have is this garbage stuff. And, and even things that are like more directly harmful, like drugs and alcohol that people still take in. Why do we do that? Because it won't kill me today, right? But those little things are significant and they add up and whatever you are consistent with is going to determine the harvest that you have. If you don't change your direction, you're gonna end up where you're headed. That's why discipline matters. I, there was a man of God named Derek Prince, an amazing guy. God spoke to him one day and said, Derek, I have an amazing call for your life, an amazing destiny, but you can't finish it because you're out of shape. You'll die first. And he knew God was calling him. Like His, his, his goal is saving souls, but God was showing him he's going to des- die of diseases related to his weight if he didn't change. So he changed so that he could keep preaching the gospel. One of the biggest lies that we believe is that we get to live twice. We live as if we get to do it twice. But the reality is, you can't go back and change what you did yesterday. It's gone. And if you spend the next five years doing what you're doing now, you won't get to try again. The next five years are going to count for what they count for and stay that way. And so we need to not pretend that we can live twice. Mm-hmm. So, summary, God is calling us to discipline. I, I share this today not because I'm there yet, but because I'm on my way, and I believe that God wants this from all of us. Um, it glorifies Him. And there's blessings that come to us when we are disciplined. There are consequences that come to us when we're not. Thank you. <laughs> I, wore my, I wore my training shirt today. <laughs> Wilderness athlete elite. All right. Well, what I want to do to end here, thanks for hanging out a few minutes longer. I just, I just want to pray, and, uh, and then we'll dismiss. But I'm sure God's talking to you. So we're just going to continue that conversation without me interrupting. <laughs> so, Lord, we just come to you right now. And, and we desire that you would be glorified in our lives. Jesus, we desire to be disciples who look like you, that we look like our rabbi. Jesus, we want discipline in our lives for our own sake and so that everyone who looks at us will be led in the path of life instead of led astray to destruction. So Jesus, I just ask this morning that you will speak to us and and highlight to us how you want us to adjust ourselves, to be disciplined. Lord, we just say we want to choose to be uncomfortable now, 
instead of uncomfortable later when it hurts more. Jesus, we want to train ourselves so that when pressure comes, we don't sink, but we stay right where we always were. Thank you, Lord. So, Lord, I just, I just ask right now that you would just speak to us. Lord, I pray that you will show us what discipline looks like, that we be able to see that in our heads, what the disciplined version of ourselves is that you see in the future, that you've called us to be. It might, God might not be talking to you about fitness at all. He may be talking to you about like, hey, you say you value the scripture, but you don't open the book. You say prayer is important, but you don't pray. You say that you want to see the lost come to Jesus, but you don't talk to anybody. Whatever it is, just say yes to him. Say yes to going on that journey with him.